It's why what we allow to go into our mind is really important. I want to suggest to you that a large proportion of anxiety that many people experience around their call is driven by what they see and what they allow to uh, come into their mind because faith operates from the place of imagination as does fear. So we're either imagining the good that will happen and believing God or we're imagining the bad that will happen and believing in fear. Hey, I'm Julian Adams. I'm all about helping people discover how to hear God's voice for themselves and bring the kingdom of God in every space and in every way. So excited that you're joining me for this video. Um, I've got a great friend, Sophia Martin, who's joining me today, and uh, we're going to be chatting around a few things. Sophia, just before we get started, why don't you tell people who you are, what you're doing, and why you're here? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia. I'm out here in Boston volunteering for Julian's team, and we are going to go over some questions today. I've got a whole list to fire at this guy. Okay, so I had, do not know any of the questions. We're just going to ad lib. Just so that you get my raw and filtered thoughts. So Sophia, why don't you shoot a few questions at me? So here is my first question. Does everyone have a calling? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, the Bible is so clear that God has made everyone with the potential of doing good works for him, bringing glory to him, and releasing purpose and destiny in our own lives. And so for me, the simple answer is every single believer has a calling in God that God wants to unlock, God wants to fan into flame, and God wants to help you discover. So then with that, what do you think are some misconceptions people have around callings? Ah, that's a great question. I think sometimes when we think about callings, we tend to think about a destination rather than a sense of God's purposes and preferred future being unfolded in our lives. And uh, the thing about God's calling to us is that they're never coerced or forced upon us. They're an invitation to partner with Him. And so when you discover your passion, when you discover what God's uniquely made you for, when you begin to find out how God has uniquely situated your life, your upbringing, your background, the place you uh, were born into, all of the dynamics of your DNA, that all of them are working to and working for the purposes of God in our life. It becomes an incredible adventure. I think one of the big misconceptions is that callings happen by some kind of default that you suddenly walk into. It. And actually, that's not what happens, it is discovered. It is something that you work together with God to find. I think the second misconception is that um, you can derail your purpose and destiny eternally. So do I think you can delay it? Do I think you can derail it in the sense that because of your own decisions and consistent ignoring of God's purposes and plans that you'll never walk into it? Yes. But do I think that you are eternally cut off from God's purposes and destiny for your life, either because of bad decisions that you've made or because of things that have gone in your life? A absolutely not. Even when things go wrong in your life, God can work things out for you. Um, so I think everything is redeemable. Your purpose, your call, your destiny is always redeem redeemable in God. I think one more thing, Sophia, that I think is a big dynamic is there is a misconception that you have to have your stuff together. Yeah. That you've got to have all of the gifts, all of the purposes. You've got to have these plans all set out before you can find your calling. That's not true. The reality is that for me, most often when it comes to the calling of God, I've discovered that it's when I don't have my stuff together that God wants to use me. It's in my place of weakness that God wants to unfold His incredible purpose and plans because that way I'm relying on God to bring it to pass. I'm relying on His favor. I'm relying on His direction. And I'm relying on the person of the Holy Spirit to work that calling out. And so for me, those are some of the misconceptions that I find common in, in how it works. God has taken me, someone who does not have enough education, enough background, enough wealth, enough um, pedigree, mm -hmm. um, and he's put me in places that I could never earn or deserve or work for. That's how the calling of God works itself out. So on that last piece, what does it look like to walk in the tension of, I'm not trying to figure everything out, 
I don't really know what to do with my life, or I don't really know what my calling is, but just stewarding the moment. Do you know, I think the, the key phrase that you use there, stewarding, is in the story of the talents, you'll see that God gives people something, and how they respond with what they're already given in that stage in their life. And you'll notice that that in, in that story of the talents, there are different amounts given to different people. And that God judges what we do with the calling of God, not based on the amount that we're given, but actually how we steward whatever we're given. And so I think there are numbers of things. I think one, stewarding does not mean bearing. Stewarding means I'm going to pursue, I'm going to figure out how I need to invest into the calling and the purpose that God has put in me. I'm going to discover what that looks like so that I can make steps in accordance with that. I don't want to just bury it and let it not grow any interest. I think the second thing is not come, not living in a place of comparison. I think comparison is one of the greatest thieves to potential. Whenever we live in a place of trying to come, uh, bring a comparison to somebody else, like what do they have that I don't have? What, are, what is the gift set that they have that I can never come into? What that does is it dulls and it squashes out what we already have in our hand. So breaking comparison. And then I, I think lastly, in terms of stewarding the tension of, I know God has called me to so many things, um, but it doesn't look like it's happening right now. It's simply about finding where I'm at and whatever, as the Bible says, my hand finds to do, to do that with all my might. I want to live in a way that wherever I find myself, I'm going, God, what do you want me to do with what I have right now? Uh, I remember growing up as a young man and um, having a sense of call to the nations. Um, but I was living in South Africa and the potential of me traveling was almost non-existent because uh, getting passports under the apartheid government was really tricky and there were just loads of complications around that. And thinking, God, how do I serve the nations when I can't even leave this nation? But beginning to realize that actually serving the person in front of me, stopping for the one in front of me, was going to help me steward the gift that God put in me for the sake of different nations. And if I could do that well for the person in front of me and and the reality is there were so many nations around me that was already in front of me like if I could just do that I would learn how to grow and be developed because if your Bible says if you're faithful with little it'll make you faithful with much and so just being faithful where I'm at began to help me discover what God had planned for me and then discover the moments of favor that we began that I began to step into yeah I love that that totally takes the pressure off when you're just looking at what's in front of you so I want to go back to you. You touched on comparison. You just mm-hmm. go breaking comparison. What does that look like? Oh my gosh! I think breaking comparison is still one of the most difficult things that I have to do. To be one hundred percent honest, I, I think in a world of Instagram, TikTok followers, all those stuff, everyone's trying to figure out who's got the biggest influence, who's who's got the biggest followership. How do I get my message out so that I can? be bigger, be better, how do I hustle my way into a bigger space? And I think it's one of the most distracting and, and, and just sad things when you're consistently competing against somebody else. Yeah. And one of the major shifts that God helped me understand in understanding the kingdom of God is that in the kingdom of God, competition is never an option. Because in the kingdom of God, there's always more than enough for everybody. Like there is no lack on God's part. And so when I began to understand that my lane, my call, my influence in the kingdom of God should never be compared to somebody else's lane, somebody else's um, call, because actually in the kingdom, there's more than enough for everyone that I will discover who God made for me it took all that pressure off I think the second thing around breaking the comparison dynamic was understanding that everything I get in the kingdom is by way of grace anyway I can't earn it I can't work for it all I can do is steward it and and that comes by way of God's grace um, and his kindness Jesus lived a perfect life and he gave that as a gift to me Jesus is the perfect older brother. In in scripture, you'll see all these older brother examples that despise anyone who's younger, that despise anyone who's coming up. Joseph's older brothers hated him. The older brother in the story of the 
prodigal um, son, hated his younger brother. The story of David, when he becomes king, all of his older brothers did not enjoy David. But Jesus is unlike any other older brother. He's the one who says, everything that I've earned, all of the inheritance that's been given to me, I give to you freely as if you earned it. And I think when I understand who I am as a son adopted by the father and celebrated by my older brother, it, it gives me the passion to pursue my call. It gives me the passion to go, do you know what? God has a, a unique destiny for me. God has a unique purpose that I get to run after because my older perfect brother is celebrating that in me. Yeah. And his is the only celebration I want. Um, and then lastly, I think the dynamic of dealing with comparison that I think God has really helped me with is to realize that when I'm comparing myself to other people, when I'm trying to uh, figure myself out in terms of am I better than this person or am I less than this person, I think one of the big things that God has really helped me discover and, and find out is the security of knowing that he ultimately is the great reward that I'm going after. I love this moment with Abraham in Genesis where, where God says to Abraham, Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward and I've called you to be a father to nations and he's giving all these promises. But he starts off with, I'm your exceeding great reward. I love Abraham's response. Abraham's response is, great, I'm glad you're my reward, but what are you going to give me? And he misses that whole moment right there that actually when you get the father, you get everything. Yeah. That when you see him as the pursuit and the goal of your call, the goal of your purpose, all the other achievements come with that. Um, it's why the Bible says seek first the kingdom. Um, it's not that seeking those other things are wrong. It's just orientating around the pursuit of him as your exceeding great reward. When you find him as the great reward, everything works itself out. I often wonder if the story of the pearl of great price um, is more about the pearl than anything else. If we can just get to realize that he is worth everything, yeah. giving up everything, pursuing him with everything, and that all these other stuff gets added, if that will orientate our heart and our affection to genuinely walk out our call a whole lot easier. That's so good. I love that Jesus is the prize. But Back to comparison for a second, I think there's another aspect that goes unnoticed, and that's kind of the copying part of it, where when you're, when you're looking at your calling and dreaming with God, I notice a lot of our dreams just begin to look at the people around us, look like the people around us. So what does it look like to expand your capacity to dream and not compare or copy the people next to you, but have that unique purpose, that unique calling, that unique dream? Sophia, you're asking me some great questions, and I'm having to think on my feet. You know, when I think about what you're saying to me, one of the first scriptures comes out of Ephesians chapter 3, I think it is, where it says that we are called to ask of God um, as much as we can, because He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think, ask, or imagine. And I love that word imagine uh, because imagination is quite a powerful thing. The Bible says that we were made in the image of God. In effect, it's the same root word for imagination, in effect, the Trinity in perfected unity and beauty imagined who we would be. And when we begin to understand that there is nothing more unique Nothing more stunning, nothing more extravagant than the imagination of Trinity um, in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that they were thinking about us. Uh, the Bible says that we were in Christ even before the foundations of the world. God was thinking about who we could be. And I want to lock into the imagination of God. I want to lock into what He thinks about me. And the beautiful thing is that when we become children of God, when we become Christians, the Bible says that He gives us the mind of Christ so that we can begin to think and imagine and dream like He dreams. And so often we look at past templates of people who've done ministry or done their specific call and we tend to burrow down into that must be what we're called to. But the truth is God wants us to come to Him and say, what are your thoughts about me? What, what do you imagine for me? 
and allow our mind to unlock a fresh perspective. And imagination is so important that the Apostle Paul says that that becomes the blank check of faith. Whatever you ask, think, or imagine, God will do exceedingly abundantly above that. So God invites us to over-exaggerate His goodness in that moment. Like, that's outrageous. And I think the thing about imagination is it requires a mind that engages with the impossibilities of this world through the lens of heaven. And so we need to allow ourselves to begin to think. We need to allow ourselves to begin to dream and imagine beyond the cookie cut predictability of this world. And that requires a redeemed and sanctified mind. It's why what we allow to go into our mind is really important. I want to suggest to you that a large proportion of anxiety that many people experience around their call is driven by what they see and what they allow to uh, come into their mind because faith operates from the place of imagination as does fear. So we're either imagining the good that will happen and believing God or we're imagining the bad that will happen and believing in fear. And I, I think one of the things that is helping me is to reframe things that are coming in because the reality is we read the news we many of us watch stuff on tv that's crazy um that produces more fear and produces more anxiety we engage in ideologies thoughts conversations either online or with our community we are living in a context right now when most gen zers feel like there's no hope because the world is spinning out of control Actually, the truth is, what happens if a body of believers begin to reimagine the kingdom coming? What happens if we begin to click into an imagination that says, no, the world doesn't have to spin out of control. That actually, we've got some answers. We've got some solutions. We've got calls in our generation that could shift the entirety of a worldview. And that's what happened throughout history. That's what brought about the Industrial Revolution. That's what's brought about the Technology Revolution. That's what's brought about creativity and thought processes and people discovering their call because they dared to imagine. And so I want to say we need some sanctified imagination to begin to unlock and to break the power of comparison that is exemplified through becoming a copycat. Like God wants us to imagine some new things. That was a long answer, but I think it was good, I hope. Yes, it was very good. Um, I love, you know, you started talking about imagination is the blank check of faith, which sounds amazing. I love the sound of a blank check. But there is a, a piece there where it's like you're starting with a blank whiteboard. So when, when people are starting to come to that space, uh, what does it look like to kind of overcome the, the fear and the disappointment around dreaming and actually take advantage of that blank check? Yeah, I, you know, I think I, I've often used this example and, and I'll, I'll use it again. I get to travel all over the world and it's loads of fun and I get to meet lots of people. And I find it fascinating the difference between people who come from an average quote unquote middle class background where most of their needs are being met. And then I rich, meet a rich, wealthy person who is a millionaire private jets, all those kinds of things. Um, there is a vast difference between the way a, a millionaire thinks and the way an average Joe Soap, I get my check at the end of the month, thinks. And it's what I call a wealth mindset, that there are some who think through a pauper, poverty, limit, limited mindset, mm -hmm. that my resources, equal my potential. And so what I have coming into my bank account is what I can then execute from my bank account. But when you think about a millionaire or a billionaire, they don't think in terms of resource, mm -hmm. they think only in terms of potential. What can I change? What can I bring? Because actually, I'm so wealthy that the resource is never the issue. And so they have a wealth mindset that I think sets them up to think, well, I want to change an economic system, why don't I? And they can do it. How much more should the children of God be thinking like that? Yes. We've got limited resources in the kingdom. We've got, we, we're the wealthiest, the bio, you know, we're the wealthiest. Jesus owns everything. 
Yet most often we think through the limitation of what we can contain or what we think about or what we can retain and then we try and make decisions out of that. Wouldn't it be amazing if we're shifting into a limitless mindset that is dominated by kingdom resource? Yeah. And so I'm not talking about like a name it, blab it and grab it prosperity gospel. I, I, I think that's for immature Christians who only think about how can I get a better Porsche or how can I get some more money? I think that's immaturity. I think when you think with a kingdom mindset, you think, how do I change a nation? How do I change a community? How do I change my university? And how do I approach my call and my purpose without thinking simply about what I potentially could make happen or what I have in a bank account or what I have in experience? But how do I lock in to the kingdom perspective that says everything I need has already been given me. The Bible is so clear that we have been prepared for every good work in Jesus. We, we have all of the resources available. Now when you start dreaming where resource is not the predetermining factor, but a wealth mindset of how do I bring radical change, Man, that gets me excited because suddenly we get to go, hold on, we can actually disciple the nations. And that's the call on the Christian, right? Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. He's not, he's not giving you a small task. He's giving you an impossible task because we need the impossible availability of the resources of heaven for us to do that. So when we come to the blank check of faith, when we come to the blank whiteboard of my purpose and my calling, the key is not to start with, hey, what can I achieve? The key is to start with, what does heaven have on offer? And to lean into that, because that unlocks your imagination. So just break this down for me day to day. I'm, I'm going, I'm praying. What does it look like just to start, to move from the middle class mindset to the wealth mindset? Well, I think you need to buy a lot more Gucci clothes. No, I'm joking. That's not what it means. Not in the budget. Uh, definitely not in the Bible. Do not take that one for real. I think for me, rewind when I was 15 years old and God began to speak 15. to me. I'm not 15. Move up. 20, 20s. Okay, I, 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 let, let's go 15 and then I'll go 20. Here's why. 15 years old, the Lord tells me, you're going to have this incredible call to the nations. I honestly started dreaming about preaching in different countries. I started imagining what it would look like. I, in fact, every single platform that I imagined I would preach on, I have preached on. When I was 15, I, I remember thinking about particular churches that I was preaching. I had no contact with them, no opportunity to meet them. They weren't in my circle of influence, but I preached in all of those churches and I preached all of those crowds. I remember saying, God, I want to preach in front of a crowd of over 5,000. The biggest crowd that I stood up in front of is 80,000. The biggest crowd that I preached in front of is 8,000 um, at, at the moment. God, God I, that's what I was dreaming of. That was what I had faith for when I was 15. 20 years old, the Lord says to me, you're going to be going to the nations. And I'm not just dreaming about the nations, I'm going to be going to the nations. I, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't have money. I don't have purpose. And I remember, uh, I, I don't even have the ability to do it. I remember the Lord sending me to the nations on my first trip to, to the UK. And God just opening up his doors for me. And again, I was dreaming about I was dreaming about preaching in particular context. I was dreaming about talking to people. And then a little bit later, dreaming about what does it look like to have influence over politicians, creatives, and, and people who are wealthy. Because I don't have anything. I got nothing. There's no, I didn't even hang out with wealthy people back then. But I began to dream. And I think one of the things I want to invite you to do from a starting point is to it's to literally picture, where could I be? What could I do? Who do I want to speak to? Who do I want to communicate with? Like literally see it in front of you. I remember seeing the churches I was speaking. I remember the, the buildings. I remember like, I would just literally start to work itself out in my dreams. I think the second thing is to pray for favor. Like, I think the great prayer of uh, Jay Bears to extend my tent to look upon me and bless me indeed. Mm -hmm. Like, God, I want your favor. 
I want your favor not because I want it for me, but because I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm blessed to give stuff away. Ask God for favor. And then the third thing I want to say is walk humbly wherever you find yourself. I think humility is one of the most underrated promotional aspects of the kingdom. They sound, it sounds like a, it sounds like two opposites, right? Like, right, like a paradox. Yeah, like a paradox. Like walk in humility and you get favor and you get blessing. Um, but the Bible is so clear that God will bring the prideful down and he will lift up the humble. And I think one of the things that I've discovered about humility, humility is not thinking less of myself but thinking rightly of myself as God sees me. Wherever you find yourself, what you do in that moment is you serve and you love and you do what God's called you to do in that space, knowing that the promotion comes from Him. And so I I want to encourage you to be a people, if you're listening to this, to be a people who, who dream big, who pray for favor and walk in humility. Because when you do, you'll see God connect the dots. You cannot network your way into favor. Not favor that comes from God anyway. And so when we get that right, everything changes. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe and drop any questions you have in the comments for our next video. We'll see you soon. Cheers, guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe. And please drop comments for our next video. <laughs> I'm getting so close. <laughs>